Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The module in progress is cell signaling mechanisms. We will consider a special subset of signaling mechanisms, what we refer to as second messenger signaling mechanisms. Of all these mechanisms, we are going to consider ligand binding to receptor, elaborating second messengers through G proteins, which finally activate kinases. The components of the second messenger signaling pathways are the G protein coupled receptor, G proteins, a set of membrane enzymes, second messengers per se, which are soluble molecules within the cytoplasm, protein kinases, which finally phosphorylate target proteins to bring about cellular responses. We will focus on four G proteins, four membrane enzymes, four second messengers and four protein kinases. In this session, we will look at some details of the first three G proteins, GS, GI and GQ. The first of them, GS or G stimulatory, stimulates the membrane enzyme adenylyl cyclase which increases cyclic AMP levels within the cell and that ultimately activates protein kinase A. This is the scheme we will discuss first. Before seeing the pathway involving the GS type of G protein, let us consider what G proteins are. G proteins are proteins found on the membrane. They have three subunits. In fact, there are two types of G proteins. This is one of them, which has three subunits and is called the heterotrimeric G protein, which has alpha, beta and gamma subunits. The other type of G protein is a monomeric protein and is called a small G protein. That is also a set of G proteins. What is common to both these types of G proteins? the heterotrimeric G proteins and the small G proteins is that they are GTPases. They can bind GTP and cleave it to form GDP and phosphate. That is why they are called G proteins. The GTPase activity of the heterotrimeric G protein is located in the alpha subunit. That is the one which will bind GTP. The G protein coupled receptors activate the corresponding G protein, whichever they are coupled to. An activation of the G protein involves this mechanism. In the resting state, the alpha subunit has GDP bound to it and activation of the G protein by the ligand receptor complex which is coupled to it causes the alpha subunit to shed its GDP and take on a GTP molecule. Now once GTP is bound to the alpha subunit, it moves away from the other two subunits and will activate the adenylyl cyclase enzyme which is also located on the membrane. Now once it has activated adenylyl cyclase, the GTP is activity of the alpha subunit will cleave the GTP molecule to produce GDP and phosphate. GDP st still remains bound to the alpha subunit and once that happens, the alpha subunit moves away from the enzyme and homes to its original position where it will be in combination with the beta and gamma subunits. So this is a cycle of events that the G protein goes through after being activated. In every case, it is going to be like this. What about the G protein B? 
that is what is said here. Now, if the ligand still remains in adequate concentrations outside, it can continue to stimulate the GPS, GPCR and the same cycle of events will go on. What next? Once the enzyme adenylyl cyclase is activated, it will act on adenosine triphosphate within the cell to produce a molecule called cyclic AMP or cyclic adenosine monophosphate. This is a very important signaling molecule within the cell. Cyclic AMP per se can produce effects which we will see later on, but we have already seen that cyclic AMP can activate protein kinase A and protein kinase A can phosphorylate proteins within the cell to produce cellular responses. We will see a real example of a ligand which uses the cyclic AMP pathway to produce its effects. The best example would be adrenaline. There are many types of adrenergic receptors, alpha, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2 adrenergic receptors and each receptor activates a different pathway. Uh, it is the beta 1 adrenergic receptor which uses the cyclic AMP pathway. When adrenaline binds to the beta 1 adrenergic receptor, the G protein is activated and we know the sequence of events where the alpha subunit moves and activates adenylyl cyclase. Cyclic AMP increases as a result of adenylyl cyclase activity. Protein kinase A is activated and what may be the target proteins which are phosphorylated by this protein kinase A. One of the proteins, we can't consider all of them which are phosphorylated as a result of adrenaline acting on beta 1 adrenergic receptor, we will see one example. One of the proteins which is phosphorylated is the L-type calcium channel on the plasma membrane. Opening of the L-type calcium channel is due to membrane depolarization. But once open, the L-type calcium channel increases its conductance or can pass more current or can allow more calcium ions to enter the cell if it is phosphorylated and that is what protein kinase A does. It phosphorylates the L-type calcium channel, calcium entry into the cell therefore increases. This is just a trickle of calcium. We will see later that calcium itself induces contraction, induces actin-myosin interaction. The details we will consider later, but just to complete this sequence of events, the calcium that came in from outside is not sufficient to induce myocardial contraction. It actually goes on to open another set of calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticular membrane. These are called rhinodine receptors. These are calcium channels and the calcium that entered from outside through L-type calcium channels opens the rhinodine receptors to release more calcium and it is that calcium coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum which actually produces contraction. Adrenaline increases contractility and one means of increasing that contractility is the CAMP mediated increase in L-type calcium channel conductance which permits more calcium entry and that calcium, the increased calcium therefore increases more calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and that is what brings about the increase in contractility due to adrenaline binding to beta 1 adrenergic receptor. Now in every case it is not going to be possible for us to say which are all the proteins which are phosphorylated by the protein kinase that is ultimately activated in that pathway. So 
this is just an example of what kind of events follow activation of protein kinase A. But henceforth, when we consider signaling pathways, we will stop at that particular protein kinase in the sequence being activated. Now, the reason for this is that these pathways, the G protein coupled pathways up to protein kinase A in this case, or another protein kinase A in another case, they are common to every cell. They have the same set of signaling pathways which are used by the ligands for which a particular cell has a receptor. Cell A can have a receptor for adrenaline while cell B may not. But cell B also will have this pathway which is used by other ligands for which cell B has a receptor. And protein kinase A in cell A may phosphorylate one set of proteins whereas in cell B it will phosphorylate another set of proteins. So it is not going to be humanly possible for us to trace every case from there till the ultimate response produced. But it is going to be eminently possible for us to look at the common mechanisms which link the varied ligand receptors to the varied responses in different cells. So that is what we are doing now, learning the signaling pathways which are common to all cells. The next one we will see is the pathway involving the GI subtype of G protein. We will use adrenaline again as our example. The receptor in this case is the alpha 2 adrenergic receptor. It is coupled to the GI subtype of G protein. The case is a vascular smooth muscle cell. And the effect of the GI subtype of G protein is to inhibit the enzyme adenylyl cyclase. The I there stands for inhibitory. And when adenylyl cyclase is inhibited, the levels of cyclic AMP in the vascular smooth muscle cell reduces. What may the final response be? Cyclic AMP in vascular smooth muscle actually induces relaxation. And decreasing the levels of cyclic AMP will promote contraction in the vascular smooth muscle cell. So adrenaline through a different receptor by decreasing CAMP levels can support contractility. The next G protein that we will consider is the GQ subtype of G protein. The GQ subtype of G protein activates the membrane enzyme phospholipase C which increases the levels of inositol triphosphate in the cytoplasm and diacylglycerol. Ultimately, protein kinase C is activated. So how does this happen? A ligand binding to a GPCR Again, we take adrenaline as our example. This gives us a sense of how the effect of a particular ligand is brought about by the type of receptor that it binds to. By binding to the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, this ligand receptor complex activates the GQ subtype of G protein. Again, the example is the vascular smooth muscle cell. And we know the sequence of events which will activate phospholipase C. Now, what does the membrane enzyme phospholipase C do? Remember the slide from the first lecture on cell membrane lipids? These were the phospholipids present on the cell membrane. One of them was phosphatidyl inositol. That was the structure of phosphatidyl inositol, phosphatidyl 
inositol. In the membrane, there is not only phosphatidyl inositol, but also phosphates of phosphatidyl inositol. Here we have phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. This is the compound on the cell membrane that is acted upon by phospholipase C, which is activated by the GQ subtype of G protein. And what does phospholipase C do? It cleaves this molecule, phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, it cleaves it at this point. The result is you get inositol triphosphate and this is the glycerol molecule, diacyl glycerol. These are the two compounds we get when phospholipase C cleaves this membrane phospholipid. So that's what happens. Phospholipase C cleaves PIP2, phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, into inositol triphosphate and diacyl glycerol. You would have noticed that inositol triphosphate is a polar compound, therefore will move into the cytoplasm, whereas diacyl, those are two fatty acids. So this compound is still lipid soluble and will remain in the membrane lipid. What does inositol triphosphate do? In the previous pathway, we saw that there was a set, there is a set of calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticular membrane called ryanodine receptors, which would open in response to calcium or in some cases in response to a voltage change. There is a second set of calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticular membrane, which are referred to as IP3 receptors. And when inositol triphosphate binds to these receptors, the channel within those receptors opens up, releasing calcium. Again, calcium per se can produce effects. We know that in muscle cells, calcium induces actin-myosin interaction in one or two ways. But in addition to its direct effects as calcium, calcium, calcium does something else. It chaperones this enzyme protein kinase C. It binds to protein kinase C. That alone is not enough to activate protein kinase C. This enzyme has to be taken to the membrane and the calcium diacyl glycerol complex activates protein kinase C. We have just seen the GQ mediated pathway. While we are here, we will consider calcium again. We know that phospholipase C activation results in IP3 generation, which itself releases calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then we know that calcium chaperones protein kinase C to the membrane and the calcium diacyl glycerol complex activates protein kinase C. But calcium within the cell can increase due to a few other mechanisms as well. And calcium can activate a set of kinases called calcium calmodulin dependent kinases. So the calcium calmodulin complex can also activate a different set of kinases, what are called CAM kinases. So that's one of the means in which calcium can act. We hope to have a separate session on calcium handling per se by excitable cells and non-excitable cells and what are the multivarious effects of calcium itself can be at a le later point of time. We will stop the session now and in the next session we will consider CGMP dependent mechanisms and the effects of phospholipase A2. Thank you for watching this NPTEL lecture.